Before listening to this show, you should watch The Sin, Chapter 3 of The Mandalorian on Disney+. Plus. I can bring you in warm, or I can bring you in cold. Hello, welcome to Galactic Initiative. Today we'll be discussing Chapter 3 of The Mandalorian Season 1, The Sin. With me as always, my good friends and Star Wars aficionados, David and Sean. Welcome, David. Hello! Welcome, Sean. Hello, my friend. Chapter 3 begins with a holographic message. Grief Karga tells the Mandalorian to deliver the asset directly to the client on Navarro. He stresses the client's impatience. The Mandalorian parks the Razor Crest at the small spaceport on the city's edge and proceeds to the client's hideout. A U Wing fighter lands next to the Razor Crest. Nod to Rogue One. As the Mandalorian passes through the city, we see an astromech droid attached to a cargo sled that will play an important role later in the chapter. We notice the city's sunken streets. All the buildings are below the rocky surface. This feature will also matter later in the chapter. Any comments regarding Karga's message, the city, or the Mando's walk to the client? You got the Mando walking with the child through the streets. So I was kind of curious as to why... There, there weren't any more attacks on him trying to claim the bounty before he gives it to uh, to the client. But uh, one of the cool things that I did like at the beginning um, was the, the child and the Mandalorian having a little bonding time together. The child was unscrewing part of the equipment. It was those little quirks in the story that I think play a, a significant part of the relationship between the two um, later on. So a couple of things about that. Uh, it's interesting that he is still willing to land, first of all, and then to David's point, just wander through the streets with, with the child and op on open display in, in the uh, bassinet. And knowing that Grief Karga is has sent these other bounty hunters after it and after him, and knowing that the client probably also had a hand in that as well, uh, it does. It's it's an interesting intro. I mean, like you say, there's there's a few callbacks to some other Star Wars material with the with the ship and some of the people we see in the streets. We see the uh, the off world Jawas and a few others wandering to the, the streets of the city, set dressing. Uh, with these, you know, the alien characters and some of these different locations. And it's nice to not always be on a desert planet or a snow planet, like to see something a little different. You know, Jeff had mentioned that the city is sort of buried in the ground. I don't know if it's because the, the climate of the planet is particularly harsh or, or what, but it's a, it's a cool look. And then, of course, we have the bonding between, you know, the Mando and the child taking the little knob off of the, off of the you know, the control panel or whatnot. Yeah, I had the same thought as the two of you. Why would the man parade the child through the streets? He has an asset that other bounty hunters have already tried to take from him. And he has, or should have, a lot of uncertainty about the client and Grief Karga in terms of handing out additional tracking fobs. So I don't have like a, a, a logical, satisfying conclusion... <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't, it, it doesn't like, parking and then just walking through the streets. <laughs> A power droid greeted the Mandalorian on his first visit to the client. This time, two stormtroopers appear at the door. One grabs the child's carriage, prompting a caution from the Mandalorian. Easy with that. The trooper retorts, you take it easy. The client and Dr. Pershing use tracking fobs to confirm the child's identity. Both show excitement for their prize. The client compliments the Mandalorian. Your reputation was not unwarranted, but considering his recent struggles, the Mandalorian responds with a question. How many fobs did you give out? The client justifies his duplicity by saying, this asset was of extreme importance to me. I had to ensure its delivery. And, as if to distract, he produces the pledged Camtono of Beskar and adds, but to the winner go the spoils. However, the Mandalorian's body language tells us that all is not forgiven. Now he knows the client and Grief Karga deceived and targeted him. We sense the Mandalorian's internal conflict over leaving the child with the Imperials. He asks, what are your plans for it? 
The client's disposition changes. More stormtroopers enter the room and the client voices displeasure. How uncharacteristic of one of your reputation. You've taken both commission and payment. Is it not the code of the guild that these events are forgotten? Is he taunting the Mandalorian while he dismisses him? And the client adds, Unfortunately, finding a Mandalorian in these trying times is more difficult than finding the steel. Thoughts? There's an, there's an awful lot to unpack in this moment where the Mandalorian is taking his payment. Is this the first time we see the Kentono? Or is yes. It? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was, so it was the first mentioned, time. but it's the first time we see it. Right, it's the first time we actually see it. So we see the ice cream maker, which is fantastic. The, the Mandalorian, we're seeing him uh, starting to think beyond the rote uh, rules and codes of the, uh, you know, of, of the guild. Because the Mandalorian is is a foundling, and because he's an orphan, he's not thinking clearly. And I'm, you know, using air quotes or whatnot. Uh, when it comes to the, the job of being a bounty hunter, he's starting to ask the wrong questions at the wrong time of the wrong people. Werner Herzog as the client just oozes evil. The fact that he doesn't care about sending out, you know, a thousand bounty hunters to achieve this goal and what that might mean for those people when they go out to do the job, uh, whether they might have to wind up killing each other or they get killed in the process. He's very, you know, ends oriented, doesn't care about, you know, what means are used, any means necessary. And, and the fact that he continues to talk at the Mandalorian about the Great Purge and what the Empire did to the Mandalorians. You know, the, the Empire took away their cultural heritage, took away their armor and melted it down into these ingots and basically murdered them and, and dispersed whatever was left of the Mandalorians throughout the galaxy. And now he's talking about retur returning to the natural order of things, you know, getting the getting the Beskar back to the Mandos. But even then he says, yeah, but there aren't that many left and they're so hard to find. You, you can You can see him thinking, this is really starting to get, kind of get to him. So to Sean's point about seeing what he's thinking, we're dealing with an actor who has a mask on the entire time. It feels like they're trying, the directors and the writers are trying to get us to put ourselves into that position. And what is our, where is our moral compass on this? What would we do? And I think that's what helps bond us to this, this character. A couple things going back Mando walking uh, the child into seeing the client. You're basically walking an infant child to death or dismemberment or I mean, who knows what they're going to do when the client revealed the amount of Beskar that he was giving the Mandalorian. One of the things that I started thinking about is all this money. Who is behind the client? Somebody else had to finance this the other the other part the the child yells out a little and if you've got a heart that's got to pull at your heartstrings right there it makes you want to just go back and get the baby Filoni and Favreau very very well done in the fact that you're hitting emotional buttons that will help propel the series later on love your point David about relating to the character seeing yourself in his shoes the Mandalorian's body language is very communicative the way he handles the Camtono, the way he picks up a few of the plates of Beskar. He's holding them, he's looking at them in his hand, he's turning them a little bit. The tilt of the head before he asks the question, for not having a face there to convey emotion, I think the director did an excellent job giving us body language that tells us this is how the Mandalorian's feeling and what he's thinking. That's not an easy task. Did you find the client to be any more ruthless or any more sinister in this scene? I, I felt like once the Mandalorian asked about the child and the plans for it, uh, a switch was flipped. Did you did you feel the same, or or was it just kind of more of the same from the client? No, I uh, I actually felt like the, a switch was flipped, and it was almost like the client was like, "You've got your bounty. It's time for you to go." Otherwise, I'm going to sick these stormtroopers on you. Yeah, it was definitely a, a switch that was flipped. I wondered how it was the stormtroopers knew to come out at that moment because I didn't see the client give, give a look or push a button. I just was like, okay, things have changed. We need a little bit more muscle in here. No, I, I would concur when the question was asked and the protocol was broken that he definitely turned on an even more menacing 
persona. The last little bit of civility dropped away from the client, and he revealed himself to be a pure imperial evil uh, instrument. So where would you guys rank the client? Krennic, Tarkin, the client, who else would be as sinister that we've seen? It's difficult because the client's persona is sinister and weird and menacing, but we see Krennic destroy Jeddah with no remorse. Tarkin, Vader. We see most of the villains doing something next level evil, but not the client. So he has this air about him, but we don't actually see him do anything that's evil. So he would rank pretty low for me, but um, I love, like Sean said, he embodies the Empire. Well, and think about this for a minute. We're talking about post Jakku, right? The, the complete fall of the Empire fledgling era of the new republic and here's a guy who's a true believer he still believes in the empire he still believes in galactic subjugation to the emperor and the rule of force and you know all of the things that go with totalitarianism he still wears the medal with the imperial cog on it he still surrounds himself with stormtroopers he is he is a true believer he is not giving up you know, he's going to reestablish the Empire if, or die. Like you say, to, you know, that, that he doesn't necessarily do anything evil. We don't witness him doing an evil act. But the fact that he is so committed to the regime, even in its collapse, that he is willing to do all of these things, spend any amount of Beskar or do whatever it takes to achieve the goal that they need, you know, the child to complete. He doesn't, he's, he's even said he doesn't care if it's dead. He just needs the body. He's clearly on the wrong side of history and he doesn't care. He radiates something really, really bad. <laughs> he is a bad guy. Later, when the client is talking to Dr. Pershing and the Mandalorians on the rooftop to listen to them, the first time I watched the episode, I didn't realize he was talking about the Mandalorian. I'm fairly certain now, based on the question the Mandalorian asks here I, and, and, and what the client says, I'm pretty sure the client was anticipating an attack from the Mandalorian. I didn't get that it was potentially the Mandalorian that would be coming back. And I can't protect you. You're probably going to go down. I didn't necessarily put, put it to the Mando. I didn't think it was the boss, though. I didn't think it was another Imperial. I was just thinking that their location they're on this planet full of bounty hunters and whatnot that all know now that there is an extremely valuable prize in their compound. He just doesn't trust the bounty hunters to keep their hands off. I mean, it, it, like you say, after a couple of viewings, it becomes very clear that in his mind, he's thinking about the Mandalorian. It, 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 to me, it just, you know, it shows that they're in the outer rim. They're not truly safe to begin with. The situation is compromised because everybody knows what they have and the value of what they have, and anybody could come for it at any moment. But again, upon further viewings, it becomes clearer and clearer that he knows that he not only did the Mandalorian cross the line, but he also knows that he crossed the line with the Mandalorian. He's absent when the attack happens. He's present in the hideout when the Mandalorian arrives to negotiate the job. He's present when the Mandalorian delivers the asset, but he is conspicuously absent when the Mandalorian attacks the hideout. And I like your point, Sean, about, okay, it's it's a planet that attracts bounty hunters. It's a hub for the bounty hunters guild. But yeah, it's this it's this one man. It's it's this bounty hunter. It's the it's the Mandalorian. Maybe he does realize he's crossed the line. He's pushed too too hard and too far. The Mandalorian brings the Camtono to the armorer in the covert. He confirms the damage done by the Mudhorn. My armor has lost its integrity. I may need to begin again. The Beskar attracts a crowd. A heavy infantryman recognizes the spoils of the Great Purge and goes for the Mandalorian's helmet. They push and shove and slash until the armorer intervenes. Having stopped the fight, she asks the Mandalorian, Have you ever removed your helmet? No. Has it ever been removed by others? Never. This is the way. Many important details in a short period. First, the reference to the Great Purge. Second, the importance of hiding one's identity. Third, the revered status of the armorer. Fourth, a critical refrain. This is the way. What are your observations? Yeah, there is an awful lot uh, going on in this, this moment between the Mandalorians. As we move through the series, we're getting little bits and pieces of what Mandalorian culture currently is, what it's striving to be. 
it's reminiscent of uh, medieval knights and there's the chivalry of combat and things of that nature. And it's also speaks to this thing that we were learning about Mandalorians, about how they're not necessarily a race of people. It's a culture that welcomes people in so long as they're willing to walk the path and obey the code, the way that they refer to. And part of this way that they live is, you know, achieving success in arms and providing for the tribe through combat or through the application of their combat skills in, say, bounty hunting. There is a jealousy of the Mandalorian. Perhaps this is you know, rubbing people the wrong way uh, in, in within the covert. And then, of course, there is the conversation regarding the Beskar and the fact that it is spoils of war and that it is stolen from them. I can see where there would be conflict. The Mandalorian is elevating himself in status. He's getting a full set of armor made from Beskar steel. The head of some of his brothers who are for lack of a better word, more pure Mandalorian or more true Mandalorian than, than he is, perhaps not foundlings like himself. The uh, the removal of the helmet and the fighting to remove the helmet, it's interesting to see. It's, it's like a, it's almost like a prize fight or, or, or some kind of status thing that if you can take another Mandalorian's helmet, then he is not worthy of being a Mandalorian, which then, of course, brings into uh, the conversation the whole Jango Fett, Boba Fett, and all that stuff, especially since... George Lucas likes to tell everyone that they're not actually Mandalorian, so they took somebody's helmet. So that becomes a big deal now in in the lore of Star Wars. The armor slash smithy uh, and her status in the in the covert. Uh, we're starting to really see that because this culture is based on warfare and based on combat, that the person who provides the arms and the armor uh, has the true power within this culture of Mandalore. Uh, for example, she talks about him and his armor and his status and his, his, his class or his his place within the co- in the covert. That armor is worthy of, of his status. And so, you know, the, you have to earn your arms, you have to earn all the stuff, and she bestows it upon them. And it's all very ritualistic. The theme here early on about following the steps and being very dogmatic about your approach to things. And this is what has served the Mandalorian very well in his work, but it's starting, we're starting to see a crumble now because he's violating the code of the, of the, the guild by asking questions and trying to stay true to his Mandalorian roots. But uh, again, there's a, a ton of stuff going on. They talk about the purge. We have a conversation about the stolen Beskar and, and what it means to the Mandalorian people. And so it's, it is, it's a lot. It's th- th- this entire episode is actually very front loaded a lot of lore and a lot of inferences to future action. I love the fact that they mentioned the Great Purge, which I know was uh, discussed during the Clone Wars and also during Rebels, so nice little callback. One of the things I did find most interesting, as much as all the Mandalorians down there wanted the Beskar, it was almost like, hey, why are you dealing with these scums? which would be the uh, Imperial officers. But it's really cool that you got this Beskar and you're bringing it back. Double-edged swords and kind of a kind of a, t- a tough situation to be in. The Mando's knife was glowing or glittering at the end. It's like a little bit of a throwback back to Solo when... Dryden yeah, and Voss. Dryden Voss, yeah. It's a vibro, vibro blade. Yeah, I, th- I thought that was pretty cool. Very subtle. We get to kind of see a lot of the the behind-the-scenes stuff that, as kids, we really thought about or tried to think about what it would look like, how it was made, what the purpose of it was. I mean, we got, in the last episode, we really got to see how uh, the Mando's armor electronics goes together. Um, We see a little bit more of that at the end of the fight. The armor had to stop him and then, you know, explain that he is part of the crew and he is true in their heritage and their ways and uh, he's accepted into our our clan and should not be questioned that was really well done one of the things that i did not think about was how jealous the other mandos were three-fourths of the mandos in terms of their armor it looked haggard i mean i'm sorry but a lot of them looked like it was just slapped on as a group looked to be really struggling and yes i'm sure there is a lot of jealousy coming from that group, especially Paz Vizla, 
The armorer revisits the topic of a signet. She asks about the mudhorn. The Mandalorian says, I can't accept. It wasn't a noble kill. I was helped by an enemy, meaning the child. The armorer is surprised. Why would an enemy help you in battle? The Mandalorian replies, it did not know it was my enemy. So the armorer crafts whistling birds and describes them as a defense against multiple enemies. While she forges his new armor, the Mandalorian experiences a flashback. Like before, we witness his parents carrying him through a raging battle. Unlike before, we see their pursuers, a heavy missile platform or HMP droid gunship and super battle droids, weapons used by the Separatists in the prequel trilogy. His parents leave him in a small cellar, and after they close the doors, an explosion rocks the area. We infer the death of his parents, which explains his hatred for droids. What did you take from this section? The conversation about the, the signet with the armor is, is interesting. We have these warriors, they you know have to achieve some great feat of arms, whether it's killing a, a, a beast that's you know, much larger, more powerful, more dangerous, or something else to earn the symbol of their achievement, their, their great combat achievement. I, and I would assume that this is some kind of level up kind of a thing. We've talked about their station. We've talked about their position in the covert. And so ultimately to get the signet is probably the, the highest achievement or the highest rank uh, as, as a Mandalorian. But also, again, we see that the Mandalorian is bound by honor to the code of Mandalore. He's not willing to accept the signet because he did not achieve this victory by himself. He received assistance, uh, which causes some confusion with the armor because you know she asks the question, well, why would an enemy help you? And at this point, I feel like there's, there's something else going on with the Mandalorian in this conversation that he is playing word games to try and perhaps cover up his guilty conscience because... What I think he really should be saying, or what he means to be saying, but he's he's not fully admitting to it, is that he, the, he is the enemy of the child, and that the child helped him because the child didn't know. You know, we've been on these adventures over the last several episodes with the Mandalorian and the child, and they've bonded, and they've had this relationship where the child keeps trying to assist the Mandalorian through healing or through lifting up the mud horn. And the Mandalorian, you know, now is in this crisis of conscience that he's turned this helpless child over to the Empire. We still don't know exactly what's going on there, but he's dealing with this, this, this guilty conscience. And I think he's trying to talk himself into feeling better about what he's done. I like the, the way this, this, the flashback device is being used in this series. It feels dreamlike. Uh, and, and a little bit impressionistic the way it's presented, but we do get more information every time. They're slightly different. They're slightly more expanded. We're on the journey with with the Mando and learning about his past as we go forward in these episodes. At first, we just we knew that there was some great tragedy, and then it grows into the next reveal where we find out his parents are leaving him. You know, they're putting him in the cellar. So there's there's this abandonment. And then now we learn that it's happening sometime during the Clone War with the droids and the you know the gunships and all that stuff. And we know that there's a great battle going on and that the Separatist army is crushing the civilian population. And so they, they put him in the, the bunker to try and save him. And then it's inferred in this most recent flashback that they were killed shortly thereafter. But we don't know at what point who rescues the Mandalorian or how he's rescued, or what ultimately saves him from the droids. But we're going to, I mean, he's ultimately going to wind up in the hands of the Mandalorians as a foundling and, and be raised, in, you know, in the way of Mandalore. I, I can't add much to what Sean said. He did a great job. I love the throwback to prequel ships and robots and stuff like that. My one big takeaway, I'm curious if bring mom and dad back. Well, we have you on record now as saying you liked something from the prequels. No, 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 no. I, yes, I, yeah, I heard it. No, Sean I heard said, it too. No, heard it too. Let's, let's back this up. I said I liked the throwback. It didn't mean that I liked the robots. I liked the throwback aspect of it. Because, you know what, I always had a problem with... Uh, gosh, what are they? The Super Battle Droid? Yes, the Super Battle Droid. Mm -hmm. I always... I, I've got two problems with the Super Battle Droid. One is... And it was it episode three? They started talking. I thought that was one of the dumbest things ever. They shouldn't. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. <laughs> and two, you know, at the beginning when they first introduced him, 
you'd shoot them and shoot them and shoot them and nothing would happen. And then all of a sudden later on, it just takes one shot and they're gone. Those are my, those are my issues with the super battle droids. So I don't like super battle droids, but it sure was great to see him again. No, <laughs> no, 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 That's exactly no, what you said. no, I said, I like the throwback. I like how they connect the dots. I mean, is that, is that continuity? Yes. Thank you. I like continuity. <laughs> Yeah, the battle droids are kind of hokey, but whatever. I, I like I like prequels, so I was happy to see all of it. What type of ship is it again? It's an HMP droid gunship, which HMP stands for Heavy Missile Platform. It's got a little face on it. It's got it eyes, like, yeah. It's got like an angry pumpkin face. And I know you hated those ships, but it was nice to see him again, so I, I get it. The Mandalorian enters the cantina in his new armor. Grief Karga exclaims, They, meaning the other bounty hunters, all hate you, Mando, because you're a legend. The Mandalorian wants to know how many hunters receive tracking fobs. Karga taunts the entire cantina by shouting, All of them, all of them, but not one of them close the deal. He shows off plates of Beskar from the client as if the shared prize would please the Mandalorian. After claiming a puck for his next job, the Mandalorian asks, any idea what they're going to do with it, meaning the child? Karga says, I didn't ask, it's against the guild code. The Mandalorian doesn't trust the Imperials. What are they doing here? I believe Karga mocks him based on their previous conversation about Imperial credits. The Empire is gone, Mando. All that are left are mercenaries and warlords. But if it bothers you, just go back to the core and report them to the New Republic. The Mandalorian dismisses his suggestion. That's a joke. Let's hear from you guys. When Mando walks in, it's almost like he's all dressed up, ready to go to prom. Grief Karga basically tells him, hey, you know, you've got all this money now. Why don't you just go chill out on a planet? Go to a, go to a Twi'lek healing bath? I don't think we'll be seeing that episode on Disney Plus anytime soon. Mando decides or grows conscious and like, hey, what, what, what's going to happen to the kid? We've had a little bonding situations going on. You know, we've had the dealing with the client where as he's leaving, the child calls out to him. It's very obvious that Mando's about to go after the child. When Grief Karga is in there and he's taunting all the other bounty hunters because of his boast and because of you know of him trying to shame all the other bounty hunters on how bad of a job they're doing it, he's confirming to the mando that he was in on this sort of betrayal with the client that in conjunction with now grief karga has beskar in his pocket his conscience is eating at him more and more you see without seeing what's going on in the head of the Mandalorian and how he's finally coming around to that decision point. We've got the situation where the Mandalorian is very rigid and dogmatic and follows his rules and believes in codes and, and honor. And he's finding that the, the bounty hunting guild, the people who run it or the people who are involved in it are playing very fast and loose with rules. I, I mean, clearly the, the, this process that the bounty hunters go through, they sit down with, with grief and he gives you the puck and you select the puck and that's your job. It's your job until you fail. That didn't apply. Now there was some question about whether it was a legitimate bounty because there was no puck. IG 11, when he showed up, he was reading off the rules of the guild and all that stuff. So it would imply that it was a sanctioned bounty, but the Mandalorian is starting to find out that he really, the only people he can trust are, his own people, you know, the other Mandalorians, mostly just himself, but the other Mandalorians, and that these other outside institutions, he's applying his moral code or his ethics to their rule systems when those groups of people don't actually have any ethics or morals and they don't even really follow their own rule systems. This erosion of his belief in the Bounty Hunter Guild is complete at this point other bounty hunters started showing up while he was on the job and all the things that he's gone through and then coming back here and finding out about the client issuing fobs to everybody and grief Karga issuing fobs to everybody else he's off of that now i think he in this moment we're, we're finding out that he's just kind of done with the bounty hunters guild and he's listening more to his conscience when it comes to the child he's making that decision in real time as we see it the, the moment when he comes in the bar, the, the shiny armor is a little too shiny at this point. 
but I'm, I'm sure that over the course of the remainder of the season, in the other chapters, we'll put a few dents and dings in it. We'll get it looking more like a real Mandalorian as opposed to you know, a brand new car. Uh, again, we're not sure if he's supremely confident in his abilities or if he's slightly naive or or what, walking at the beginning of the episode, walking through town with, with the child, now wandering around in a shiny, brand new Beskar Steel uniform. It's very troubling to me because early in this episode, uh, the client says there aren't a lot of Mandalorians around. Clearly, the, the Mandalorians, they live in secrecy. They live in hiding. They're trying not to draw too much attention to themselves, trying to stand on the radar because they've gone through the Great Purge. All these things, they're, they're basically hunted people. They're not, they, they can't fully integrate back into galactic society. So when the client is saying earlier on in the episode that you can't find Mandalorians, you, know, you can't find a Mandalorian to make you the armor even the, or make you things with the Beskar, but you got the Beskar back and you, that whole taunt. For him to show up the next day with a brand new set of armor, he is, he is betraying the covert. Look at me, I have brand new Beskar armor, but he's also saying, clearly I know other Mandalorians and I know skilled armorers who are Mandalorians who can make this. And they're not too far from here because it's literally like within 24 hours. He gets back, he drops the kid off, goes back in the, the, the covert, has a fight, gets new armor, and then goes back to the bar to get his next job. He's showing his hand. Uh, it's, it's a very brash decision to put on that that brand new armor and go into the bar to talk to Grief Karga in that scene. Wistfulness over a missing shifter handle prompts the Mandalorian to stay on Navarro. He scouts the client's hideout and finds the carriage in a dumpster, an indication that the child won't be leaving. Rooftop surveillance using a listening device in his helmet, coordinated with his rifle scope, reveals a worrisome conversation. The client orders Dr. Pershing to extract the necessary material. Dr. Pershing references an unknown male. He has explicitly ordered us to bring it back alive. The client shifts gears. Finish your business quickly, as I no longer can guarantee your safety. So, the Mandalorian makes a fateful choice. Let's talk about the factors that influenced him. Why did he decide to rescue the child? The decision is, is being made throughout the episode. It's little things here and there where the Mandalorian is, is really starting to regret, well, first of all, taking the job. But having taken the job, having completed it and, and handed over the child to the client, the, the conversation that's had there, the, the conversation about the mysterious, who is he and what does he want, clearly something going on beyond Werner Herzog's character. We've seen it with his interactions with Dr. Pershing. They're almost at, at competing interests in a way. Uh, the scientist wants the child alive and wants to do his science, whatever that is. Werner Herzog is very goal-oriented. Do what you have to, just get it done. The safety issue, is it safety from the mysterious he? Is it safety from the situation that they're in on this planet? Or is it safety from the Mandalorian? Does Werner Herzog know in his, in his mind now, after having had his interaction with the Mandalorian when he when they did the handoff, because the Mandalorian is asking questions and because the Mandalorian is breaking rules, that it's only a matter of time before he comes back looking for the child. But the extracting the material thing, you know, this is one of those ongoing questions that we have. The Camino Cloner logo appearing on Dr. Pershing's uniform, which is an Imperial Science uniform. Now, after having seen Rise of Skywalker, we have a conversation about Imperial cloning. So that's that's a thing. And we also understand that Palpatine is being cloned, as well as Snoke and other Force users. So the question is, the material that's being extracted from the child, is it genetic material that they need in order to help re-clone Palpatine? Is it midichlorians? What is it specifically? What is this material? I don't think we're going to get an answer anytime soon, but it's going to be this underlying driving point of what is the purpose of obtaining the child and what is performed on it or going to be performed on it 
and, and to what ends? Like, what is what is it going to be used for? So we have all of that going on. So here's the Mandalorian. I, I think the the final thing though that pushes him, yeah, if if he needed any more motivation, which I don't think he does, but if he did, seeing the bassinet in the dumpster, I think is really the, like sort of the last thing that he really needed to to see in order for him to fully commit to the process of saving the child's life. Pretty stark visual reminder that you won't be needing that anymore because the child's not going to survive whatever's going to happen. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. As soon as I saw the bassinet, my first thought was, oh, it's probably too late. Um, again, some pretty dark scenes in this one. I, I also love the fact that this blaster, we saw another uh, another use for it. I mean, that thing is like a Swiss Army knife. Tools for every little occasion. So I love that he was able to you know, zoom in and listen into the conversation that they had and also be able to see, I mean, it's the, the heat, heat sensor of it. One of the things that popped in my mind while he was talking about, it had really dawned on me that the client was trying to protect both of them from the Mando. I was thinking more on the lines of who who is leading this whole charge of getting material from the child. I mean, now that we've seen Rise of Skywalker, we, we pretty much know that they're trying to just get... Uh, material to potentially use for cloning. And I do want to compliment you, Sean, Midichlorians. I know that's not your favorite to uh, to talk about uh, in terms of Star Wars lore, but it would go back to uh, Phantom Menace. I mean, if they're able to extract the Midichlorians and use them, definitely a, a possibility. There's that offhand comment, you know, in the Phantom Menace where they do the count on Anakin. And he says it's the highest concentration. It's like even Yoda doesn't have that high. And now we have a baby Yoda. Well, yes, the midichlorians are not my favorite thing in Star Wars. It can be a logical inference from what we saw in Phantom Menace and what we've seen now in Rise of Skywalker. Potentially, the it's the midichlorians that they're trying to harvest. The Mandalorian begins his rescue by breaking the eyeball security system. Then he blows a hole in an exterior wall and enters the hideout. He kills 14 stormtroopers to accomplish his goal, but he does not kill Dr. Pershing, though he had an opportunity. He finds the doctor with the child and an interrogation droid. Pershing pleads for the child's safety and takes credit for protecting it. The Mandalorian takes the child from a surgical bed and spares the doctor. We see the whistling birds kill four troopers. What were your impressions of the Mandalorian's assault? That was very calculated. Very impressive. The medical droid throw back to uh, A New Hope. Dr. Pershing said, uh, I, I, I protected him. When somebody goes into that type of a uh, tone, it's almost like there's more to Dr. Pershing than is being let on. If you go back to that conversation, I can't protect you. I'm wondering if Dr. Pershing is one of the higher ups, you know, in order to fake out the Mando be- to preserve his life, he's playing the dumb medical guy. Curious as if, if we end up seeing him in season two as a more prominent figure, but their overall fight between the Mando and the TKs, the TKs actually showed some, some military precision. It's hard to understand why the, the TKs were not able to take him down. I, I, I like the addition of the lights on the end of the E-11s. The whistling birds were a nice touch. I mean, something else that we had never seen in action. I think Boba Fett had something that looked like the whistling birds on his wrist. Great job by Deborah Chow with all the action sequences. It only makes me that much more excited about Obi-Wan, the series that's coming, if this is the type of work that she's doing. I mean, she did two episodes that I liked. So nice, nice choreography, nice camera work. Just pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's a very well executed, straightforward action scene. We got to see the Mandalorian use all of the, the tools in, the, in his box, torch that one stormtrooper, cooked him in his armor. Oh, I forgot about uh, that one. Yeah, that was, yeah. that was nice. Grappling hook and, of course, the whistling birds and all that stuff that was you know, foreshadowed earlier in the episode. He was doing the tactical move by using the aggressiveness of the stormtroopers against themselves. The whole scene, though, the interaction with, with the doctor, 
the thing there, the detail in this moment is when, when the, the Mando is going to, or heading over to the hospital bed to free the child. And you see the scanner on top of him. There's these red lines that are being shrunk in sequence. And I'm wondering if even though the Mandalorian ultimately rescues the child from this facility, that some extraction was completed. And uh, if we are going to see the doctor show up again, these decisions and these visual cues and these things that we see very calculated, everything is there to specifically direct the fans to engage in some way with the story, uh, whether it's a callback to a previous series or a previous movie or it's something like this. The Mando could have killed everybody, but we couldn't find the client. The client was gone. He was off site. There's people who survived this this interaction with the Mandalorian, and, and they did it on purpose. So it will be interesting to see, like David said, if the Doctor pops up later, and of course the project that he's engaged in. I love the the interrogation droid showing up. Another pull from somewhere else in the Star Wars universe for continuity purposes, which is great, and everything you'd want in an action scene. Exciting, but not over the top. Didn't seem gratuitous. All in, it was it was very well done. Tracking fobs throughout the city begin to pulse. The Mandalorian tries to reach his ship, but Karga and the bounty hunters surround him. The confined street and the astromech droid that controls the cargo sled now come into play. Karga tries to negotiate for the asset and says he might spare the Mando's life. Gun-toting hunters move closer. The Mando leaps onto the cargo sled for cover. He manages to kill many of his assailants, but Karga shoots the astromech to prevent the cargo sled's escape. Just when all seems lost, the covert arrives. Mandalorians with jetpacks wipe out the remaining mercenaries. At the spaceport, Karga surprises the Mandalorian on board the Razor Crest. Good anticipation by Karga, but the Mandalorian uses his wrist lasso to trigger steam from the carbon freeze unit as a diversion. Then he shoots Karga in the chest, knocking him out the rear hatch and flies away. Karga recovers because his newly awarded plates of Beskar blocked the fatal shot. What interested you in this final scene? Seeing in, in live action what we've seen in the Clone Wars cartoons and Rebels and whatnot, the Mandalorians come in and all their glory with their jetpacks. And that to me was, was the big, the big payoff. I mean, the, the standoff in the street and the, the rolling gunfight with all the bounty hunters. And that to me was straight out of a Western that I watched growing up where the guy hops in the back of the wagon and the wagon starts to kind of, the horse takes off and, He's going down the street and shooting the bad guys out of the back of the wagon and all that stuff. And it was classic. And it, it was great. Again, we get to see the Mandalorian using the disintegration feature on his Swiss Army knife of a rifle. The conversation between Grief Karga and the Mandalorian about giving up the child and I'm your best hope. And if this episode has taught the Mandalorian anything, it should be that he cannot trust Grief Karga, period, end of sentence. The Beskar in the chest, kind of a neat thing, so we're going to see grief later. Mandalorian gets away with, with the child. The, the whole scene, it was the, the climax to this, this episode, and, and it was everything that, that I had wanted and anticipated out of it. This wraps up the first story arc in a way. Clearly, with the fob working, this is a, a temporary reprieve. He's safe for now. When the asset leaves the compound, that all the, the fobs start going off again. It's kind of, it was a cool effect that I, everybody who had been given a fob before was sitting around in the bar and the fob went off. The only thing about the, this episode, the end of the episode, was when the heavy infantry guy was flying along next to him and gave him the salute and flew off. It felt very Iron Man y, but that is, it's creating. Closure between the two of them from what happened earlier in the episode. The Mandalorian is now fully accepted as a member of his tribe and, and the covert. They have come to his rescue. They understand that the risk that he was taking to do what he was doing is consistent with the principles and the ideals of the Mandalorian way. In his act of defiance, to the bounty hunting guild and the remnants of the empire by rescuing the child he is fully living the mandalorian credo 
to find and protect orphans and, and the vulnerable. We talked about how the Mandalorian is very rule-driven and very dogmatic, but he's learning that the institutions and the rules outside of Mandalorian culture can't be trusted and should never be put above the way. And so he's fully embraced the way. He is rescuing this child and he is accepting the mantle of Mandalorian at that point. I see them coming to his rescue as an acknowledgement of that. It causes so many problems for the covert because they could have just stayed underground, let the Mandalorian deal with his own problems. But I think it's it's an acknowledgement of this full growth of the Mandalorian into fully realized, actualized warrior who embraces and walks the path completely. It was a great ending, another great episode in the series. I would definitely agree the salute. <laughs> it, it, I, I could have done without it. But I'll be honest with you. As soon as I saw Grief Karga put the best car into his chest i was like ah we're gonna see that again because i mean it's straight out of a western you know the, the battle was great i love the the clan came to his rescue and realized that he is one with them but all in all i mean really solid episode it definitely moved the story along did you expect the covert no i don't think i think it was a nice surprise i felt like they were trying to stay hidden as much as possible and now obviously he was important enough to make that sacrifice so it was it was uh it was a surprise i didn't necessarily anticipate the whole covert showing up i I knew somebody was going to come help him there was the feeling that you know he was he was losing control of the battle and great danger and you you knew something was going to happen i didn't expect the entire covert maybe the heavy weapons guy shows up or Maybe this would be a surprise introduction of one of the other characters. I don't know. Someone else, or we'd be introduced to, you know, one of these, you know, other characters. We saw a lot of, like, for example, we saw a lot of marketing going into this about the cast of the show. And knowing that there's, you know, the Cara Dune character was widely circulated, the various individuals that, would be assisting though to the earlier conversation he kind of blew their cover anyway so they might as well go out with a bang and, and take everybody out but between the mando killing all the stormtroopers and the covert killing all the bounty hunters i guess who's left at that place a few townspeople but they're not going to have a lot of business anymore who's going to the bar <laughs> but anyway i didn't expect what i got but i was very excited about the entire clan of, of Mandalorians flying in and saving the day. Do you think the armor will be painted for next season? Oh yeah, because they have to sell more toys. And if you do, what? how do you, you know, what do you paint up? We went from colored armor to the Beskar. Now, did, did Boba Fett have Beskar or did Jango have Beskar? Do we no. know? It's hard to tell with Jango because the armor was silver. There is conversation about the helmet the episodes of the Clone Wars that were not finished where Cad Bane shoots Boba Fett in the head. And that's where the dent comes from. And it's not Beskar. But again, that's an episode that was never never finished and never aired. And it's all part of that conversation that you know George Lucas had where he right. talked about how Jango Fett was a great bounty hunter but didn't walk the Mandalorian path or whatever. So he wasn't a Mandalorian. It's like It's all very confusing. But the whole, I guess this whole thing is to try and distance Boba Fett and Jango Fett from the Mandalorians because the, the, the story they were telling about Mandalore and the Clone Wars and trying to make them a noble people and Boba Fett and Jango Fett were unsavory types. They needed to fully stay in the realm of bad guys. I do have one question. One oh thing boy. before we go. What is the sin? It could be one of two things. Going against your word. Or giving up the child. I think it's one of those two. Forming the attachment. Breaking the guild code. And working for the Empire. Ah, working for the Empire. Yep. You know, I, yep. Again, yep. again I, there's so many different ways you can look mm-hmm. at it. You know, yeah. but what sin are we talking about? I mean, are we talking about the sin of whatever the Mandalorians are trying to overcome? 
the sin of the great purge was the sin was it forgiven was it washed away like i don't know as an audience with this show we we're allowed to interject ourselves and our own perspectives on a lot of the, the content it's a nice intellectual exercise because we don't have an answer for it it's just something i've been thinking about a lot with just the title of the episode <laughs> Our discussion of The Mandalorian Chapter 103 has come to an end. We will tackle Chapter 104 soon. We will also post a Lightspeed report or two in the coming weeks. Thank you, David. No problem. Thank you, Sean. This is the way. If you like the content, please tell others and subscribe to the channel Galactic Initiative. We end with a legal disclaimer. Galactic Initiative is not authorized or endorsed by Lucasfilm Limited. The name Star Wars and all related materials are registered trademarks of Lucasfilm Limited, a subsidiary of the Walt Disney Company, all rights reserved. Galactic Initiative is registered trademark and other product and company names are trademarks of their respective holders. Use does not imply affiliation or endorsement. This is acceptable.